Hi guys, welcome to Vans Reading again. We're reading Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. Kahneman. Uh, we're in chapter 7 now. Uh, machine for jumping to conclusions. That the, that that's what the chapter is called. And I'm going to start reading now. The great comedian Danny Kay had a line that has stayed with me since my adolescence. Speaking of a woman he dislikes, he says her favorite position is beside herself and her favorite sport is jumping to conclusions. The line came up. I remember in the initial conversation with Amos Tversky about the rationality of statistical intuitions, and now I believe it offers an apt description of how System 1 functions. Jumping to conclusions is efficient if the conclusions are likely to be correct and the cost of an occasional mistake acceptable, and if the jumps, if, and if the jump saves much time and effort. Jumping to conclusions is risky when the situation is unfamiliar. The stakes are high and there is no time to collect more information. These are the circumstances in which intuitive errors are probable, which may be prevented by a deliberative intervention of System 2. Neglect of ambiguity and suppression of doubt. They've given me a, a, a figure six. There's like a, you can see here, let me see. Uh, sorry. Jesus, God damn, damn, God, give me a second. This thing is awkward. Here, can you see it? Is it good? Yeah, that's pretty good. Do it for three seconds. One, three, two, one. You paused it. Great. Uh, so that's what the figure six shows. It shows ABC and a post bank. One, two, three, one, four. What do three exhibits, exhibits, what do three exhibits in figure six have in common? Ooh, what do they have in common? What do the three exhibits in figure six have in common? The answer is that all are am ambiguous. You almost certainly read the display on the left as ABC. Yes. And the one on the right as 12, 13, 14, but the middle item in both displays are identical. You could just as well have read them as a 13C or a 12B14, but you did not, why not? The same shape is read as a letter in context of letters. And as a number in a context of numbers, the entire context helps determine the interpretation of each element. So let's see, it says A, an approached bank. I don't see it. Okay, hold on. Uh, you could just as well have read, so and the one on the right is 12, 13, 14, but the middle items in both displays are identical. You could just as well have read them as A13C or 12B14, but you did not. Why not? The same shape is read as a letter in context of letters and as numbers in the context of numbers. The entire context helps determine the interpretation of each element. Okay. Oh, fuck, yeah, there is a B over there. Huh, <laughs> didn't even notice it. Whereas there is a 13, so you got A13C, but there is one, two, B, 14. And is there a C in the middle? I don't know, no, there is, but there is an A and a B, which is interesting. If you go back in the video, you can see it. You could just as well have read them as A13C or 12B14, but you do not. Why not? The same shape is read as a letter in context of letters and as numbers in context of numbers. The entire context helps determine the interpretation of each element. The shape is ambiguous, but you jump to a conclusion about its identity and do not become aware of the ambiguity that was resolved. I love this book because it makes me look so stupid. <laughs> I just, it's just every time because you have to read it slow. And then because you're like, what? What is he talking about? Like, and then you're like, ah. Yeah, I'm just retarded, apparently. Oops, sorry, not that word. I mean, not retarded, maybe mentally challenged. No, nope, that's not bad. I'm just stupid. There we go. That's the best word. Apologies. Don't cancel me, please. I'm just one man. As for an, Anne, you probably imagined a woman with money on her mind walking toward a building with tellers and secure walls. But this plausible interpretation is not the only possible one. The sentence is ambiguous. If an earlier sentence had been, they were floating gently down the river, you would have imagined an all, you, you, you would have imagined an altogether different scene. When you have just been thinking of, of a river, the word bank is not associated with money. 
in the absence of an explicit context, System 1 generated a likely context on its own. We know that it is System 1 because you are not aware of the choice or of the possibility of another interpretation. Unless you have been... canoeing recently you probably spent more time going to banks than floating on rivers give me a second guys Anyway, back to me. Uh, uh, da -da 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 -da. So we know that if it came over, it would bring some such in my case. They were floating gently down the river. You would have imagined an altogether different scene. When you have just been thinking of a river, the word bank is not associated with money. In the absence of an explicit context, System 1 generated a likely context on its own. We know that it is system one because you were not aware of the choice or of the possibility of another interpretation. Unless you have been canoeing recently, you probably spent more time going to the banks than floating on rivers. <laughs> and you resolved the ambiguity accordingly. When uncertain system one bets on an answer and the bets are guided by experience, the rules of the betting are intelligent. Recent events and the current context have the most weight in determining an interpretation. When no recent event comes to mind, more distant memories govern. Among your earliest and most memorable experiences was singing your ABCs, you did not sing your A13Cs. The most important aspect of both examples is that definite choice was made, but you did not know it. Only one interpretation came to mind, and you were never aware of the ambiguity. System 1 does not keep track of alternatives, that it rejects or even of the fact that there were alternatives. Conscious doubt is not the repertoire of System 1. It requires maintaining incompatible interpretations in mind at the same time, which demands mental effort. Uncertainty and doubt are the domains of system two. I have a theory about, this is an interesting thing because about IQ tests. Now, IQ tests have, you know, those puzzles that you do, right? And they say, oh, okay, you and mathematical equations, whatever, it just depends on what's in the IQ. The whole point is when you do those puzzles, a person with like, let's say, no experience with puzzles or has or has done that type of puzzle before would know it would take him ages to do. Someone would have to teach him uh, to do things because like, for instance, here's another example like jujitsu. Jujitsu wasn't just invented on the spot. It became people started learning different techniques, creating new techniques. And that's an that's what I like. That's what you do. The whole concept is you learn and so you build new techniques so you learn and you build and for, you know like iq tests kind of ignore the fact that uh, that humans need context before actually applying action and then you look stupid because you have no context i think maybe the best way an iq can help you understand how intelligent you are is by understanding okay, you're living in this world you, and they tell you, oh, you have a higher IQ. What does that mean exactly? It, I think it just means that you have a better context of this world of how maybe, uh, how, of, of not the world, but the knowledge that it provides. And that's what maybe makes you uh, intelligent. Uh, sure, but there's really a lot of depressed intelligent people out there. There's also not that successful intelligent people out there. The whole point is it's not... Some will say, oh, but success doesn't equal IQ. Yes, but that's not the point. The point is, like, in, my point is that everybody trying to, you know, learn and do something new um, and create something new and maybe become a mathematician or, sorry, mathematician, how do you say mathematician? Mathematician, uh, like, or a amazing writer or 
amazing scientist, quantum mechanic, whatever you want to do, like the whole point is that you got to understand there is context and you first learn the context of, so you learn the rules, like our ABCs, you learn the ABCs to speak the language. So the, the, that's why you know your English or whatever language you know very well. And that's the whole point here is that I think the book is trying to also tell you that I think it's a beautiful thing to assume that people, you know, it's not a beautiful thing. It's a terrible thing that people like, so you see a person and he doesn't know anything. The thing is, is, is he doesn't have the context to like, for instance, poor kids, they, I mean, they would have to perform mer I mean, I've heard, you know, you know, kids, poor kids, especially who've done very well. And then there's other kids who don't, but I feel like that has to do with the environment their context of trying to understand why they need to do this or as well as what how to learn these these areas better i think that's pretty super interesting that this is actually commenting on that in the world context matters man everywhere and some people sure don't know knowledge some people you know don't do certain things some people have a different lifestyle and that's the whole point i guess i think that's an interesting factor that it's not that people <clears throat> majority of people are stupid is that they're not in environments that allow them to <sighs> learn uh, and it's, they're not in environments that help them become better people because we're so easy to manipulate and to impress and put impressions on us that oh this is what you need to do or you're not good enough or you're not, you know, you're not, you can't be like anything because it's a, it's a dangerous world out there because it's all about survival at the end of the day. Right. So people are against each other. They, they unconsciously do this. Some people consciously know this, but some, most, most people unconsciously do this because it's just natural and we just go with the flow. And my point is that the winners always are going to put the losers down because they always want to be winners and that's the fact you want to you don't want to die and that's you want to live and that's how the game works and the context matters man the context does really matter on the fact of how of what you learn in life or what you do in life um and when i mean context is i mean the environment you know everything you know like for instance what if like here's another bad kid is doing bad in science why is he doing bad in science someone has not given him the correct context to learn from scratch has not given him his abcs to go and teach him how to do science and then the teacher says oh he's stupid he doesn't know crap he doesn't know this it's not that something is wrong he needs better information he needs clearer information he needs to and then people say, but he can do that by himself. Ah, it depends. It depends. He needs motivation. He needs a reason. Uh, it's an interesting concept. Uh, and that's it. So I'm going to keep on reading because I find it extremely interesting. And I think people should learn that, that you're not stupid. You just have no context. I think that's a pretty good story. I think that's a good motto in life. You need context to move forward. You need... You know, you need, you see people like, you need motivation. It's like, yes and no. You need, motivation should come naturally. And I think that it shouldn't, when I, mean, I mean naturally, are people like, what do you mean naturally? It's just you and that's why you do it. No, there is a reason why we choose to survive. I think we, if you tap into your own survival instincts, like I would recommend watching like Andrew Huberman, uh, Huberman, his concepts of how you work as a person, as a human being, motivate your actual body to do things, and and you act and you allow yourself to reward yourself to be a better person, and I think that's a great thing, and that's what people should do. But anyway, that's um, that's my. Anyway, I'm continuing. The most important aspect of both examples is that definite choice was made, but you did not know it. Only one interpretation came to mind, and you were never aware of ambiguity. System one does not keep track of alternatives that it rejects, or even of the fact that there were alternatives. Conscious doubt is not in the repertoire of system one. 
and requires maintaining incompatible interpretations in mind at the same time, which demands mental effort. Uncertainty and, and, and doubt are the domain of system two. Interesting. A bias to believe and conform and confirm. The psychologist Daniel Gilbert, widely known as the author of Stumbling on Happiness, once wrote an essay titled How Mental Systems Believe, in which he developed a theory of believing and unbelieving that he traced to the 17th century philosopher Baruch Spinoza. Gilbert proposed, uh, sorry, Baruch Spinoza. Gilbert proposed the understanding a, that understanding a statement must begin with an attempt to believe it. You must first know what the idea would mean if it were true. Only then can you decide whether or not to unbelieve it. Whoa, that's deep. The initial attempt to believe is an automatic operation of system one, which involves the construction of the best possible interpretation of the situation. Even a nonsensical statement, Gilbert argues, will evoke initial belief. Try his example. White fish eat candy. <laughs> you probably were aware of vague impressions of fish and candy as an automatic process of associative memory searched for links between the two ideas that would make sense of the nonsense. Gilbert sees the unbelieving sorry. Gilbert sees unbelieving as an operation of system two, and he reported an elegant experiment to make his point. The participants saw nonsensical assertions such as a dinka is a flame followed after a few seconds by a single word true or false. <laughs> they were later tested for their memory of which sentences had been labeled true. In one, in one condition of the experiment, subjects were required to hold digits in memory during the task. The disruption of system two had a selective effect. It made it difficult for people to unbelievable, unbelieve false sentences. In a later test of memory, the depleted participants ended up thinking that many of the false sentences were true. The moral is significant. When System 2 is otherwise engaged, we believe almost anything. System 1 is gullible and biased to believe. System 2 is in charge of doubting and unbelieving. But System 2 is sometimes busy and often lazy. Indeed, there is evidence that people are more likely to be influenced by empty persuasive messages such as commercials when they are tired and depleted. That is super interesting in today's world. But I don't agree with the laziness. I think what he means is that that system too can't use that much energy. It requires quite a lot of uh, energy to do certain concentration, focus, and you know, focus and analysis of work. It it requires a lot of you know energy to perform these types of actions. Like imagine you doing a hectic maths calculation. Imagine you playing chess. Like I heard there's burn quite a few calories playing video games and uh, playing chess. These are the type of things that show you that your body uses your energy to really have immense focus because you, you're trying to, you're burning all that energy to, to do this one, one thing and it requires that much energy. I wouldn't call the system too lazy. I would call it, it is a maybe limited. It is extremely limited, it's like a muscle and it requires exercise and it requires rest and that's a great example for today's word political political correctness the work world it's an interesting concept because that's why so many people don't want to change it's so hard for them to unprogram because they it, it's un, it's you you are so you have to you to do that reverse of being incorrect and especially at a later age it caused de detrimental uh, regret, and it, and I don't think a lot of people want to feel that. So they rather believe that they that what they're saying is true, and yeah, that's that's an interesting um, concept here because it shows you why a lot of major like not minor majorities don't want to change. Intelligent people who use um, the system too often shows that you know that they can decipher and break the code whereas not something's fucking weird man that's not right uh and whereas people who are you know not that smart or very easy to uh, manipulate or impressionize i'm not saying that everyone is you know there's some people who can't i mean maybe there is but the whole point is people can be broken down and they can be manipulated into doing anything, no matter who you are or what they are. It's just who, it's just the biology. And I can prove that with World War II. I mean, that's just the example of Nazis. That's how it is. It's an interesting thing. 
and but that's what we are we're human beings that take in information anyway the operations of associative memory contribute to a general confrontation bias when asked is sam friendly different instances of sam's behavior will come to mind than would if you had been asked is sam unfriendly a deliberate search for confirming evidence known as positive test strategies also how system two tests a hypothesis contrary to the rules of philosophers or science who advise testing a hypothesis by trying to refute them People and scientists quite often seek data that are likely to be compatible with the beliefs they currently hold. The confirmatory bias of System 1 favors is uncritical acceptance of suggestions and exaggeration of the likelihood of extreme and improbable events. If you're asked about the probability of a tsunami hitting California within the next 30 years, the images that come to your mind are likely to be images of tsunamis in the manner of Gilbert Pro in the manner. In the manner. Gilbert proposed for nonsense statements such as whitefish eat candy will be prone to overestimate the probability of a disaster. Exaggerated emotional coherence halo effect. If you like the president's politics, you probably like his voice and his appearance as well. The tendency to like or dislike everything about pers uh, about person, including things you have not observed, is known as the halo effect. The term has been in use in psychology for centuries but it has not come into wide use in everyday language. This is a pity because the halo effect is a good name for common bias that plays a large role in the shaping our view of people and situations. It is one of the ways the representation of the world that system one generates is simpler and more coherent than the real thing. You meet, woman, you meet a woman named Joan at a party and find her personable and easy to talk to. Now, her name comes up as someone who could be asked to contribute to a charity. What do you know about Joan's generosity? The correct answer is that you know virtually nothing because there's a little reason to believe that, that people who are agreeable in social situations are generous contributors to charities. But you like Joan and you'll retrieve the feeling of liking her when you think of her. You also like generosity and generous people. By association, you're now predisposed to believe that Joan is generous. <laughs> and now that you believe she is generous, you probably like Joan even better than you did earlier because you have added generosity to her pleasant attributes. Yeah, that's happened to me quite a few times. <laughs> Real evidence of generosity is missing in the story of Joan and the gap is filled by a guess that fits one emotional response to it. In other situations, evidence accumulates gradually and the interpretation is shaped by the emotion attached to the first impression. In an enduring classic of psychology, Solomon Ash, Ash presented descriptions of two people and asked for comments on their personality. What do you think of Alan and Ben? Alan, intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, envious. Ben, envious, stubborn, critical, impulsive, industrious, intelligent. If you're like most of us, you viewed Alan much more favorably than Ben because I said the word intelligent first and Ben is envious. So the first thing you do is you like the guy who does the good thing first. That is kind of true and interesting. If you're like most of us, you viewed Alan much more favorably than Ben. <laughs> the initial traits in the list change the very meaning of the traits that appear later. The stubbornness of an intelligent person is seen as likely to be justified and may actually evoke respect, but intelligence in an envious and stubborn person makes him more dangerous. The halo effect is also an example of suppressed ambiguity, like the word bank. The, adject the adjective stubborn is ambiguous and will be interpreted in a way that makes it coherent with the context. Isn't that interesting? That the fact is, like that's in superhero movies, we already know who the good guy is and we know about the bad guy. The bad guy does the bad thing first. He doesn't do a good thing at the end. Or maybe he does do the good thing and then he, it depends. The question is, who do we like first? We like the person who does the good thing first because it's all connected to our little crazy minds about survivability. It's an interesting thing. Question, who do you like first? The person who does the bad thing first or the good thing first? Obviously, you would do the good thing first. Duh. What if the guy does the later good thing? No, because he did the bad thing first. Because his first choice was the bad thing, right? So we assume that will be his next choice as well. That's pretty interesting, right? Weird. And probably do you think you'll do it again? Maybe. But we should look at everybody skeptically, even if they're good or bad. Even me. 
not a perfect person, I'll be honest. But anyway, the point is, let's continue with this. I don't want to go into detail. A machine for jumping to conclusions. There have been many variations on this research theme. Participants in one study first considered the first three adjectives that describe Adam. Then they considered the last three which belonged they were told to another person when they had imagined the two individuals the participants were sorry going too fast which belonged which so let me go back there have been many variations on the on this research theme participants in one study first considered the first three adjectives that describe adam then they considered the last three which belonged they were told to another person when they had imagined the two individuals, the participants were asked if it was plausible for all six adjectives to describe the same person. And most of them thought it was impossible. <sighs> the sequence in which we observe characteristics of a person is often determined by chance. Sequence matters, however, because the halo effect increases the weight of the first impression sometimes to the point that subsequent information is mostly wasted. Early in my career as a professor, I graded students' essay, essay exams in the conventional way. I would pick up one test booklet at a time and read all the students' essay in immediate succession, grading them as I went. I would then compute the total and go on to the next student. I eventually noticed that my evaluations of the essays in each booklet were strikingly hom homogenous. I began to suspect that my grading exhibited a halo effect, and the first question I scored bad a so a first question I'd scored but had a disproportionate effect on the overall grade. The mechanism was simple. If I had given a high score to the first essay, I gave the student the benefit of the doubt. I had, if I had given a high score to the first, essay, I gave the student the benefit of the doubt whenever I encountered a vague or ambiguous statement later on. This seemed reasonable. Surely, a student who had done so well on the first essay would not make a foolish mistake in the second one, but. There was a serious problem with my way of doing things. If a student had written two essays, one strong one, one strong and one weak, I would end up with different final grades depending on which essay I read first. Whoa, that's that's a fucking deep. I had told the students that two essays had equal weight, but that was not true. The first one had a much greater impact on the final grade than the second. This was unacceptable. Huh. Yep. So that tells you. Favoritism in teachers exist highly. No ways in hell. Even if you if you're not a likable kid or something and like the teacher doesn't and gives you bad rib. Sorry, bro. She doesn't like you. No matter what you'll do, maybe you'll get like a 60 or a 70, but they'll still like the other guy first because he did the good thing first and you did the, the good thing later. So it really doesn't matter. Everything always leads to the same thing. How does that person make me feel first? If it feels makes me feel, I will go with my intuition and say, hey, I trust the, the person who did the good thing first. It's kind of, yeah. I adopted a new procedure. Uh, instead of reading the booklets in sequence, I read and scored all the students' answers to the first question, then went on the, to the next one. I made sure to write all the scores on the inside back page of the booklet so that I would not be biased, even unconsciously. When I read the second essay, soon after switching to the new method, I made a disconcerting observation. My confidence in my grading was now much lower than it had been. The reason was that I frequently experienced a discomfort that was new to me. When I was disappointed with the student's second essay and went to the back page of the booklet to enter a poor grade, I occasionally, dis I occasionally discovered that I had given a top grade to the same student's first essay. I also noticed that I was tempted to reduce this discrepancy by changing the grade that I had not yet written down and found it hard to follow the simple rule of never yielding to that temptation. My grades for the essays of single student often varied over a considerable range. The lack of coherence left me uncertain and frustrated. I was now less happy with le and less confident in my grades than I had been earlier, but I recognized that this was a good sign and indication that the new procedure was superior. The consistency I had enjoyed earlier was sparse. It produced a feeling of cognitive ease and my system too was happy to lazily accept and accept the final grade. By allowing myself to be strongly influenced by the first question and in evaluating subsequent ones, I spared myself uh, the dissonance of finding the same student doing very well on some questions and badly on others. The uncomfortable inconsistency that was revealed when I switched to the new procedure was real. 
it reflected both the inadequacy of any single question as a measure of what the students knew and the unreliability of my own grading. The procedure I adopted to, detain, to tame the halo effect conforms to a general principle. Decolorate error. To understand how this principle works, imagine that a large number of observers are shown glass jars containing pennies and are challenged to estimate the number of pennies in each jar. As James Sur Surowitzki explained in his best-selling The Wisdom of Crowds, this is the kind of task in which individuals do very poorly, but calls of individual judgments do remarkably well. Some individuals greatly overrest greatly overestimate the true number. Under underest others underestimate it, but when many judgments are average, the average tends to be quite accurate. The mechanism is straightforward. All individuals look at the same job, and all their judgments have common basis. On the other hand, the errors that the individuals make are independent of the errors that are made by others. And in the absence of the system by systematic bias, they tend to average to zero. However, the magic of error of error reduction works well only when the observations are independent and their errors uncorrelated. If the observers share share oh, freaking hell, this is gets, your mouth gets tongue twisted. If the observers share a bias, the aggregation of judgments will not reduce it. Allowing the observers to influence each other effectively reduces the size of the sample and with it, the position of the group estimate. <sighs> to derive... <laughs> this all is way. To derive... <laughs> Stretching the mouth. It's terrible. To derive the most useful information from multiple sources of evidence, you should always try to make these sources independent of each other. This rule is part of a good police police procedure when there are multiple listen oh god i'm so dead when there are multiple witnesses to an event they are not allowed to discuss it before giving their testimony the goal is not only to prevent collusion by hostile witness it is also to prevent unbiased witness from influencing each other witnesses who exchange their experiences will tend to make similar errors in their testimony reducing the total value of the information they provide oh my god so even like court systems are a little bit shit because they kind of have to, you know, I share, you, I share my experience because I believe this. I share, you see, like, which, which means one thing, everybody else's experiences influences their experiences. So like if you're in a court case and there's like a multiple people with, um, let's say not witnesses, let's say, what do you call those? P jurors. Yes, the jurors. They can be influenced by each other. I mean, the whole point is like, oh, we have to debate. You know, I think this because of this. But because you're in a room with them, people will be influenced, right? Depends on, I don't know, but I feel like you could, a lot of, I think, you, I think if you could look at the data of how jurors actually, you know, random people, and we compare how they judge people. Like, what was the verdict of this? What was the verdict of that? How, you know, like, how was that verdict? If you asked him, I bet you would, you could find out like, oh, this is why we decided on this. This is why, I mean, that, it's a lot, but it could be, you could, def there's definitely a pattern there. The question is who's guilty or not guilty. That's a terrible, you know, that's a, that's a question. Like you can see how many people get incorrectly um, put in jail and people are still in jail for crimes that are not as important, but that's not the point. Anyway, let's continue. <sighs> Eliminating redundancy from your sources of information is always a good idea. The principle of independent judgments and decorated errors has immediate applications for the conduct of meetings. Uh, an activity in which executives and organizations spend a great deal of their working days. A simple rule can help. Before an issue is discussed, all members of the committee should be asked to write a very brief summary of their positions. This procedure makes good use of the value of the diversity of knowledge and opinion in the group. The standard practice of an open discussion gives too much weight to the opinions of those who speak early. Whoa, the standard practice of open discussion gives too much weight to the opinions of those who speak early and certainly causing others to line up behind them. So, 
People can be easily manipulated if you just say the words first. Interesting. So if you were like, oh, what is your opinion? And you come up first, then people follow the opinion. And it kind of does, it is proven. For instance, there is a video, I think, if you look at it, uh, you know, watch people stand up waiting in a room and people start doing weird movements. So every time someone goes in the door, they have to like do a weird movement and people follow the same person. So there's a whole video about this. And what's interesting, this is completely true. I've seen it happen many times. People do stupid things. People wait in lines. People will open doors weirdly. If someone else opened the door, it's just a thing. It's not just a thing. It's just human nature trying to follow rules in order to survive. But anyway, what you see is all is there. So what you see is all there is. Well, why Siati? One of my favorite memories of the early years of working with Amos is a comedy routine he enjoyed performing. <laughs> Imperfect impersonation of one of the professors with whom he had studied philosophy as an, undergr uh, as an, undergr as an undergrad. Oh my God. As an undergr under undergraduate, Amos would growl in Hebrew mocked by a thick German accent. You must never forget the primat of the is. What exactly his teacher had meant by that phrase never became clear to me or to Atmos, but Atmos jokes always made a point. Uh, you, uh, what exactly his teacher meant by that phrase never became clear to me or to Amos, I believe, but Amos's jokes always made a point. He was reminded of the old phrase and eventually I was too. Whenever we encountered the remarkable asymmetry between the ways our mind treats information that is currently available, and information we do not have. An essential design feature of the associated machine is that it represents only activated ideas. Information that is not retrieved even unconsciously from memory might as well not exist. System one excels at constructing the best possible story that incorporates ideas currently activated, but it does not slash cannot allow for information it does not have. The measure of success for system one is the coherence of the story it manages to create. The amount and quality of the data in which the story is based are largely irre irrelevant. When information is scarce, which is common occurrence, System 1 operates as a machine for jumping to conclusions. Consider the following. Will Mindic be a good leader? That's a terrible name. She is intelligent and strong. An answer quickly came to your mind and it was yes. Yeah, because she has a good name, right? You pick the best answer based on the very limited information available, but you jump the gun. What if the next two adjectives were corrupt and cruel? Then no. Take note of what you did not do as you briefly thought of Mendic as a leader. You did not start by asking, what would I need to know before I formed an opinion about the quality of someone's leadership? System 1 got to work on its own from the first adjective. Intelligent is good. Intelligent and strong is very good. This is the best story that can be constructed from two adjectives and System 1 delivered it with great cognitive ease. The story will be revised if new information comes, such as Mindig is corrupt, but there is no waiting and no subjective discomfort. And there, are, and there also remains a bias favoring the first impression. Huh. Yo, okay. The combination of current seeking system one with the lazy system two implies that system two will endorse many intuitive beliefs, which closely reflect the impressions generated by system one. Of course, system two also is capable of more systematic and careful approach to evidence and of following of a list of boxes that must be checked before making a decision. Think of buying a home when you deliberately seek information that you don't have. However, system one is expected to influence even more careful decisions. Its input never ceases. This is a great book from marketers. <clears throat> we make great first impressions. We we not and we like first impressions, right? So that shit that shares all the, the info. So I don't know. But what happens? Does it change it up? Ah huh. Interesting. I just had a thought. What happens if the first impression changes every day due to your memory? So it, and it depends on the context as well. So if the first impression, hmm, this is interesting. I had a similar situation. First impression I made of people. 
first day great next day different people why <clears throat> this is interesting factor maybe i didn't make a bad print. nope that's not the case i think what happens is that people tend to have short span memories or per day they can't well obviously and so if they had a good day or a, i mean they had a good day with me on the first impression it'll be great but then the second if something awkward happens to be and they're like mm, maybe we should back off so your first impression does really matter in the beginning and might matter per day because people's moods change and people forget and so there's a cycle of what happens but there's also the um propaganda where you probably could influence people by uh giving positive reinforcement every morning this person's good this person's good you wake up that will be their first impression and there's probably like a cycle going on that we probably just ignore and that's and you just need to be sub i think system one of everybody else needs to you know take into the fact a good thing then they'll provide you with like positive emotions or whatnot but yeah but that's an interesting concept uh, <clears throat> the combination of a current seeking system one with a lazy system two implies that system two will endorse many intuitive beliefs which closely reflects the impressions generated by system one of course system two also is capable of more systematic and careful approach to evidence and of the following of list uh, and following a list of boxes that must be checked before making a decision thinking of buying a home when you deliberately seek information that you don't have however system one is expected to influence even the more careful decisions its input never ceases. Jumping to conclusions on the basis of a limited evidence is so important to an understanding of intuitive thinking and comes up so often in this book that I will use a cumbersome abbreviation for what for it. It's called YCATI, which stands for what you see is all there is. Ooh, I like that. What you see is all there is. My CRT. What you see is all there is. System one is radically insensitive to both the quality and the quantity of the information that gives rise to impressions and intuitions. Amos, with two of his graduate students at Stanford, reported a study that bears directly on what you see is all there is by observing the reaction of people who are given one sided evidence and know it. The participants were exposed to legal scenarios such as the following. On September 3rd, Plaintiff David Thornton, a 43-year-old Union Field representative, was present in the thrifty drug store 168, performing a routine union visit. Within 10 minutes of his arrival, a store manager confronted him and told him he could no longer speak with the union employees on the floor of the store. Instead, he would have to see them in the back room while they were on a break. Such a request is allowed by the union contract with thrifty drug but had never been before have never been sorry had never before been reinforced when mr thornton objected he was told that he had the choice of conforming to these requirements leaving the store or being arrested at this point mr thornton in, indicated to the manager that he had always been allowed to speak on the employees on the floor as much for 10 minutes as long as no business was disrupted and that he would rather be arrested than change the procedure of his routine visit. The manager then called the police and had Mr. Thornton handcuffed in the store for trespassing. After he was booked and put into a holding cell for a brief time, all charges were dropped. Mr. Thornton is suing thrifty drug for false arrest. Hmm. In addition to this background material, which all participants three different groups were exposed to, Presentations by the lawyers for the two parties naturally <clears throat> for two well, for the two parties naturally the lawyer for the union organizer described the arrest as an intimidation attempt, while the lawyer for the store argued that having the talk in the store was disruptive and that the manager was acting properly. Some participants, like a jury, heard both sides. The lawyer added no useful information that you could not in infer from the background story. The participants were fully aware of the setup and those who heard only one side could easily have generated the argument for the other side. Nevertheless, the presentation of one-sided evidence had a very pronounced effect on judgments. Furthermore, participants who saw one side evidence were more confident of their judgments than those who saw both sides. This is just what you would expect in, if the confidence that people experience in, is determined by the coherence of the story they managed to construct from available information. 
is the consistency of the information that matters for a good story, <clears throat> not its completeness. It is the consistency of the information that matters for a good story, not its completeness. Indeed, you will often find that knowing little makes it easier to fit everything you know into a coherent pattern. What you see is all there is facilitates the achievement of coherence and of the cognitive ease that causes us to accept the statement as true. Huh. So what we see, so what we see, oh, sorry, let me say, so what we, what you see is all there is makes us believe that it is true. And that where, that's where propaganda comes in. It explains why we can think fast and how we are able to make sense of partial information in complex world. Much of the time, the coherent story put together is close enough to reality to support reasonable action. However, I will also invoke what you see is all there is to help explain a long and diverse list of biases of judgment and choice, including the following among many others. Overconfidence, as the <laughs> as what you see is all there is rule implies neither the quantity nor the quality of evidence counts for much in subjective confidence. The confidence that individuals have in their belief depends mostly on the quality of the story they can tell about what they see. Even if they see little, we often fail to allow for the possibility that evidence that should be critical to our judgment is missing. What we see is all there is. For, uh, furthermore, our associative system tends to settle on coherent pattern. So anything of activation and suppresses doubt and ambiguity. So anything coherent, with a, anything with a pattern that is creating some kind of association, we believe it's true. So any kind of pattern, in fact, that, you know, creates any pattern that creates association or well, that's pretty much a pattern right is that we think it's true so there you go if there's a pattern it means it's true in our minds which is actually kind of interesting uh, framing effects different ways of presenting the same information framing effects different ways of presenting the same information often evoke different emotions the statement that the odds of survival one month after surgery are 90% is more reassuring than the equivalent statement that the mortality within one month of surgery is 10%. Similarly, cold cuts described as 90% fat-free are more attractive than they were described as 10% fat. <laughs> so using positive words or associative framing effects like Instead of using words fat and use fat free, people will buy it more. The equivalence of the alternative formulation is transparent, but an individual normally sees only one formulation and what she see, what she sees is all there is. Base rate neglect recalls the, the meek and tidy soul who's often so there's so there was framing effect, there was overconfidence, and there's now base rate neglect. Recall Steve. The meek and tiny soul who's often believed to be a librarian, the personality description is salient and vivid. And although you surely know that there are more male farmers than male librarians, that statistical fact almost certainly did not come to your mind when you first considered the question. What you saw was all there was. That's a very important statement. So now the final conclusion is, speaking of jumping to conclusion, she knows nothing about the person's management skills or she's going by the halo effect from from a good presentation. Interesting. Uh, let's decolorate errors by obtaining separate judgments on the issues before any discussion. We will get more information from independent assessments. They made the big decision on this basis of a good report from one consultant. What you see is all there is. What <clears throat> They did not seem to realize how little information they had. They didn't want more information that might spoil their story. What you see is all there is okay <clears throat> so great chapter um basically yeah well everything we we try to do a lot of correlation with things especially when we see like uh, this amount of information and 
you know, I think that's an interesting thing, but that's like an automatic res res survival response. Um, we just do it automatically because we're trying to figure out a puzzle or we're trying to figure out how to, you know, survive. And I think that that's the system. It's automatically, it, it is done to do, it's, we do that because it just, it is, it, we just do it. We just do it, we just do it. Now, we do it because we know that leads to better survival. Just our mind knows that this is the best way to do things. It works, it keeps us going forward and it, like it just it does make sense the whole i always say that if you're doing if your brain is doing something if it's tired or if it's doing something like making a mistake or understanding something or you know just certain things that are something is wrong i'm gonna say, say it one more time if we are doing something hard for instance we go in, we go and do, let's say, a, a hard maths equation. We try to attempt it. That's the information we have, right? And then what happens? It, we struggle to, to answer the question. So what do we do? We, we have to back off. We back off because we, we don't know what to do. We do not have the resources, but that's not the case. If you do back off, right, your brain needs a rest. But within this rest period, what happens is it actually does some calculation in the back unconsciously. And that's your system one, believe it or not. And it works. Like I would recommend if you have a problem and you've been like on three hour, one hour, or it's not working, it's just not working, not working. Do yourself a favor, go away for 15 minutes to an hour, come back, and it'll be easier because you've allowed yourself for your brain to process it. You're not using that second system where you're trying to analytically solve, 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 solve. And so you figure it out and it starts to, the puzzle starts to come together. But that's the point here I'm making is that <clears throat> how we manage this, what you see is all there is. We tend to, to immediately, intuitively manage things. And that's how we do it. We just keep on organizing things because our mind needs to organize it and that's it. But yeah, anyway, I'm going to end it there. Uh, sorry for staggering a bit. Sometimes I can go off in many directions. I try to calm myself down because I have millions of ideas in my head and I'm just, it just doesn't, you know, sometimes flow in one direction. It goes <laughs> like a Mexican when he drinks tequila. But that's not the point. The point is, uh, yeah, comment on what your thoughts are. I hope you enjoyed this part of the video. Um, yeah, thank you so much and see you guys in the next video.